Hey folks, welcome back. This is Elliot with The Proper Poor Pearls Almanac here today, and we are a podcast. And you can find this podcast on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcast entertainment. And of course, you can find us on Patreon if you're enjoying what we're doing here and you'd like to help us cover some of the costs of hosting the podcast. We don't explicitly offer any traditional content focused on specific goals of the podcast to our patrons in terms of limited access or anything like that, but knowledge is for everyone. We have started up a Patreon-only miniseries called The Prologues, during which we will do some critiques on various ecological subject matters. If you're interested and you're willing to donate $2, it's up on our Patreon. And we've also released one episode that was asked by Popular Demand for public consumption. So that's a good place to go check it out and see if you're into that sort of thing. On top of this content, we've got stickers available and we're including some footage from Andy's farm and where we're putting some of the theory that we talk about here into practice. If you want to see some of that, check it out on Patreon. And we do also have a new Venmo that Andy set up that you should plug now because I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is either. I think it's at Poor Pearl's Almanac. And if somebody else has that handle, let us know if it's not us and I will find them. They're going to make it like right now because we just told them it doesn't exist. I think Listen, it exists. It's, I'm pretty sure it's If you want to give us tips or something or if you just want to give us $5 to tell me to shut up, go ahead and do it. Um, we're also on Instagram and Facebook if you want to follow us over there. And if this is your first episode, we highly, highly recommend going back to our first episode of this series and catching up since each episode springboards from the previous content. So this mini series we're working on right now is really focused on this idea of rethinking how we imagine food systems, in this case, uh, medicine systems, the way our communities are built and designed and how we define community. And today we have a special guest, Dr. Greg Susla, who has been a volunteer at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine since January 2011. He had received his pharmacy degrees from the University of Connecticut and Florida, and completed a critical care pharmacy residency at the Ohio State University Hospitals. Dr. Susla spent most of his career as an ICU pharmacist at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and volunteered his time at the ICU. Dr. Susla recently retired as the Associate Director of Medical Information at MedImmune in Maryland. Dr. Susla also oversees the management of the gardens at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and the Pry House. We brought him on so we could chat a bit about the role of medicine and medicinal gardens in the modern era. There's a lot of information out there on the internet and it can get overwhelming even as somebody that has some experience in plants to try to figure out what's fact and what's fiction. I think it was really interesting to hear his perspective utilizing his background in medicine as well as his experience as a gardener and how these two worlds combine and how we can think about the future. So hopefully you guys get some really good insight out of this and helps answer some of the questions you might have lingering about this idea of what plants should I plant in my garden? Should I plant any plants in my garden? And where can I go to actually get good information? Yeah, and foxglove is totally useful and belladonna looks delicious, but don't eat it. Yeah, so take a listen and let us know what you think. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. I know you've got an extensive history, both in medicine and with your Medicine Garden project. So I'll let you introduce yourself and your work. Thanks, guys. I'm uh, Greg Susla. I'm a pharmacist by training. I graduated at the University of Connecticut School of Pharmacy in 1980, and that's what started my interest in medicinal gardens. Uh, the university or the school of pharmacy had a medicinal garden outside its building and I would wander through the garden and look at some of the plants in the garden and then see them as we were taught in class or see them in the textbooks that we're using. Uh, I then went on and spent most of my career as the ICU pharmacist at the National Institutes of Health, uh, Bethesda, Maryland, and then moved on to the pharmaceutical industry. But about 10 years ago, I became a volunteer at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland. And they have three sites. They have the main museum on East Patrick Street in Frederick. They have the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers uh, office down in Washington, D.C. And then they have the Pry House on the Antietam National Battlefield. And the Pry House was the, um, the center for George McClellan uh, or his official uh, area uh, during the Battle of Antietam, where he and Jonathan Letterman, the medical director there with the Potomac, actually commanded the battle. And I was talking to a museum staffer one day who was actually, um, who had actually started 
a probably a combination kitchen and medicinal garden on the grounds of the Pry House. And so I asked him one day if he wanted some help because I said, you know, I have an interest in this. I'll be glad to help you. And uh, after that, uh, he moved on to a graduate school and left the museum. So in 2016, I was talking to the uh, museum people and said, uh, what's the status on the garden? They said, well, it's kind of fallen into disrepair. And I said, I'd be interested in taking it over and reconstituting it again. So in 2016, my wife and I and a couple of other museum people uh, started working on the garden. And at that time, I think we planted about 10 plants. Uh, today, we have about, oh, I think between 30 and 40, depending on which ones have survived the weather, the winter, uh, and the varmints. Amazing work. It's a pretty varied experience that you've had getting into this type of work. As somebody that doesn't have a medical background, I find it really hard to sift through the fact and fiction of what exists on the internet because you can look up any plant just about and it seems like somebody will say it has some kind of a medicinal use. Uh, and that that becomes really challenging. I guess, how does your uh, background in medicine guide that project in terms of what you wanted to plant in the garden? So to start, to start off, the plants I selected, um, initially, somewhat naively, I wanted to pick plants that would have been in the mid-Atlantic area in the 1860s, the time of the Civil War. So I talked to a gentleman who runs Strictly Medicinals out in Oregon, who's a great source of medicinal plants, uh, and said, this is what I want to do. What should I grow? And he said, that's a great question. I'll call you back. And he called me back in about a week or so with a list of plants. And then I realized that the plants we had in the garden, some of them like ephedra go back 5,000 years, senna goes back 5,000 years, that there was nothing unique about the mid-Atlantic area in the mid-1860s. So the next place I went to were a period medical and pharmacy textbooks. So the United States Pharmacopeia, the United States Dispensatory, some of the Materia Medica books that had the plants that I was interested in that I could validate that they were in the official compendia of the time during the Civil War that had some medical value that those are the plants I would plant next. So the, gar the garden now contains the majority of the plants I can all reference to uh, period medical and pharmacy textbooks from about the 1820s to about the 1880s. So there, many of these have a history going back thousands of years, but in the United States, these are plants that were recognized as clearly of medicinal value in the official compendia. And that's what I'm working with now. So when I write the column for the, new, for the museum's website on the garden, I use period correct textbooks describing uh, what plants were used, how they were used, and describing them in the words of the 1860s. Yeah, that's um, something that I found the blog a few years back when I was trying to figure out more about utilizing med medicinal gardens and trying to find somebody that was actually both historically accurate and um, with some medical background. And I happened to find it. And uh, it's something I've been checking on for the last couple of years. And then this project came up with the podcast. And I was like, oh, I definitely have to reach out and uh, see if I can get, get somebody that can speak to it on the podcast. So I appreciate it very much. This is something I've been following for much longer than this podcast. So I was under the impression reading the, the blog that you've put together, or the column rather, uh, it sounds like this was probably one of the last um, official medicine gardens in the United States. Is that accurate? Uh, no, there's actually uh, a lot of medicinal gardens in the United States. I don't think they're uh, publicized or advertised, but if you look for them, uh, you'll find them. So in Washington, D.C., we have the National Arboretum, and within the National Arboretum, they have a section that's a medicinal garden. If you go to the botanical gardens up in the Bronx, they have a section on medicinal gardens. Some of the old schools of pharmacy still have medicinal gardens. So one of the important physicians during the Civil War was uh, Dr. Porsche, who wrote a book on looking at indigenous species in the South to use as alternatives to medicines that couldn't be obtained from the North. Well, he went to the Medical College of South Carolina, which is now the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, and they have Porsche's medicinal garden there. So you could go visit it in Charleston. The University of Connecticut School of Pharmacy, where I went and put up a new building a couple of years ago, and they planted and opened up a medicinal garden about a year or so ago. So if you look for them, you're going to find them 
in various places. Uh, here we have the, the uh, University of Maryland extension in Washington County where Antietam is. And on the extension grounds, uh, part of their garden is a medicinal garden. So if you look for them, um, you're gonna see them, but you, you probably have to look long and hard to see who actually has one. But we're not alone. Our just the ours is dedicated to a certain period. A lot of them are just general uh, medicinal gardens, but you will find them if you look for them. It does sound like these medicinal plants are they are around in in these uh, gardens that people have constructed, but they are native to certain regions. Uh, do you ever see them being reintroduced back into, I guess, like you know, more natural habitats, or do you see them only being used as medicines from this point forward, knowing that they could be useful as well as fatal? So I think a couple things. I don't think they're being. Uh, replanted in a natural environment. If they are, I'm just not aware of that. I don't know. A lot of the medicinal gardens today, like the National Arboretum, like our garden, uh, like other gardens, they're really ornamental gardens. They're not really being used uh, to harvest plants to extract drugs from them. Now, people have who believe in this probably have their own backyard garden where they have plants and they use them for their own personal use. But the sure. scale of economy to, to do these today, it's really not uh, effective. You have to grow acres and acres and acres if you wanted to have a commercially viable product to then put on the market. You know, some of the, some of the plants we still use, like autumn crocus is still used for colchicine. So, you know, that, that, that goes on, but to have large medicinal gardens to extract medications, um, it really is not the same as, as it was years ago. Now, I do say that, that keep in mind that 80% of the world still gets plant-derived medicines and the World Health Organization, uh, their list of essential drugs uh, contains a lot of medicines that are plant-based medicines because of where they are in the world. They don't have access to the modern uh, medicines that they're still plant-based medicines. So it's still used, but in um, some of the more you know modern societies, not to the same extent it was used years ago. I'm kind of curious as a somebody that does garden, uh, what your thoughts are on these types of plants and how climate change might impact the regions where they grow. Is there any I'm just kind of curious if you have any like concerns or risks that you think might come up in the future. Sure. I think that, uh, you know, a lot of it probably goes back to uh, the use of uh, both climate change, but also the use of pesticides and herbicides, uh, insecticides and the like, let's say killing off the pollinators. So killing off the bees is going to have an impact on the ability to, to grow these plants. So I think not only the weather that can destroy, I think the climate or impact the climate where a lot of these plants are grown, but also the chemicals that we use today can have a significant impact as we reduce pollinators and things like that. I think the other thing, the commercialization uh, or the, the sprawl of mankind and in closing down on areas where these plants have grown and taken away um, these plant areas or these uh, garden areas and putting up a parking lot, uh, I think it's going to have an impact too, because you lessen the area where these plants uh, may have been obtained. They don't evolve with their environment anymore. And ultimately, in the long term, they'll, they'll struggle to exist outside of controlled ecosystems. I think that's a fair statement. I'm not a biologist or a botanist, so, uh, but I think that sounds like a fairly, sta a fairly safe statement. So one of the uh, posts you had in the columns uh, was around foxglove, which is, I guess you could call it like a hyperbolic plant. Like it's something either people love or they hate it mm -hmm. uh, because it's a beautiful flower, but it can be so dangerous. Um, I noticed that was something you had included in the garden at some point. I'm not sure if it's still there, but I, I, I'm curious about uh, if that's something that draws people in when they see it, or, you know, is that something that you, in retrospect, maybe regret planting or like what what was the role of that plant in terms of the garden and I guess in our understanding of plants as medicine or poison? So I think the first thing is that, and I want people to understand all plants are poisonous or have the potential to be poisonous. People think these plants are natural, they're safe, they're not. And I'll, we'll talk about some stories about that. Foxglove is a relatively uh, dangerous plant if ingested but there's other plants that do bad things. Now, the other thing which I wanted, it's not so much used in America, but if you go to Europe, a common name for a medicinal garden is a poison garden. So you can't see this, but I have the Blarney Castle poison garden map. 
if you go to Allenwick Castle in Northampton, England, they have their poison garden and the sign on the gate says these plants can kill. So I want people to understand that just because it's a natural plant and they have it in their backyard, it doesn't mean it's safe. It means it can be extremely toxic. So you bring up foxglove, which can be a toxic plant. It has uh, agents that affect the heart, uh, digoxin, digitoxin, wabe, and like that. So it could be a cardiotoxin, if you will. But if you go to um, uh, Blarney Castle in the Blarney Poison Garden, they have a plant called belladonna, which I wrote on in the um, in the column. And belladonna brings us three drugs. It brings us scopolamine, which we wear in patches behind our ears for motion sickness. It brings us atropine, which we use to dilate the eye in your eye doctor's office, and it speeds up your heart rate. And also it has hyacinamine to um, to settle your stomach. If you go to the Blarney Castle and look at belladonna, it's under a cast iron grate. Uh, it's a beautiful plant, absolutely pl uh, stunning plant, and it has beautiful uh, berries on it, purplish to blue berries, uh, which are extremely toxic. And it's toxic to children. But they look delicious. They look delicious, exactly. Uh, you're exactly right. And so little kids may eat them and have an adverse event. I had belladonna in the garden a couple of years ago, and when it died, I didn't put it back because of the safety risk of having it there. I'm not worried about foxglove. If you go to Ireland, you're going to see foxglove growing all along the sides of the road. It's ubiquitous in the sides of the road. I don't think it's that toxic. But the, like Belladonna, um, I just felt it was just too poisonous. It was too hazardous to put that back in the garden. So when it died, I didn't plant it back. So I think you have to look at this in the range of, of let's say safety in the sense that there's two ways to look at safety. A, it doesn't work, it's ineffective and your disease is gonna progress or B, you can go to the other ex extent where it's just too toxic, it's toxic, it's not safe if you ingest it. And everything else I think is probably somewhere in that spectrum from that perspective. But I think it's important for people to realize all plants have the potential to be toxic either because the active ingredient or some other chemical constituent or contaminant that may be in that plant. So that I think points to uh, one of the challenges as somebody that doesn't have that extensive medicinal background. So like if you go to like, I went when I was in college, I went to um, like this uh, Salvation Army and got like this old book from the 70s that was like the, you know, the encyclopedia of medicinal plants. And it's mm -hmm. like three inches thick. And, it, you know, I, a dumb 19 year old I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, I, I'm going to, you know, utilize this and then you go through it and it's overwhelming and uh, everything from dandelions up uh, is considered somehow medicinal. And I'm just kind of curious from the from your perspective, what what is a realistic understanding of how plants could actually be incorporated into a healthy lifestyle or, you know, a, a backup plan or whatever you might want to call it? So first, you know, the science of studying plant-based medicines is called pharmacognosy. And that goes back to the 1600s. And so we, we, there's truly a science behind plants and plant-based medicines. And it's, it's a true science. Uh, it was taught in pharmacy schools up to about um, probably the early 1970s. So by the time I went to pharmacy school, it was gone. I think people have to realize that, I think there's a couple of things here about looking at this. First is that you can have the confluence of the perfect storm if you don't know what you're doing. So in the sense that, A, what you think you have may not be what you really have and what is the accurate diagnosis. And so you need to be, you know, understand that that rash on your hand may not be contact dermatitis. It may in fact be an autoimmune disease that's manifesting as, as the rash. The second thing is, you know, based on what you think you have, what are the natural treatments for it? And what's the science behind that? And I think one of the things that should, I think, elicit a question in someone's mind is when I go to that textbook and I see it can treat everything from hemorrhoids to brain cancer, something's not right here. It can't be that effective for all these ranges of diseases because drugs just don't work that way. And that's got to raise a question uh, in someone's mind, gee, I'm, I'm going to use this for contact dermatitis, but it says that I can treat heart disease. And oh yeah, my grandfather's got prostate cancer. It's good for that. Maybe I should give him some of this too. That doesn't make sense. And people need to understand that when they select these things. And then how do they know, how are they making the decision that it works? 
you know, echinacea probably has no medicinal value. It's a billion dollar drug and people take it and say that, oh yeah, I, I took some echinacea and seven to 10 days later, I was better. Well, that's probably just the course of your viral illness. And so I think there needs to be an understanding of A, you can find that textbook and it says, my God, these plants are wonderful. Look at all the diseases they cure. Like I said, asking the question, it doesn't make sense. And if you see that it has something that you think you have, then going out and really trying to do your due diligence to see what is the actual science of that plot, of that plant, the chemical it contains that actually treats the illness you think you have, that needs to be done. Uh, we're getting a lot more of that now going forward. Uh, the NIH has an office on alternative medicines so they're looking at studies. I participated in some of those studies. So we need more of that to really focus on and hone in on where are these, what these plants are, what chemicals they contain, and what chem what these chemicals are really effective in treating before we start taking them. That does bring me to one of my questions. For herbal medicine, it seems you need various plants in various phases in order to create safe vehicles to accurately dose. I guess my question is, how do you see the future of growing these plants versus um, growing them commercially and extracting the active ingredients to make you know, regular RX drugs. I guess you're saying the only safe way to do that going forward is to take the RX drugs where the active ingredient has been extracted and put into a vehicle that you can safely dose rather than having all of these, you know, alternative side effects or uh, the question of this cures, you know, a uh, trench foot as well as like, it makes my, my fingernails grow faster. Exactly. So India is the medicinal garden of the world today. A lot of work is being done in, in, Italy, in India where they have a significant number of the indigenous plants may have some medicinal value. I think it's like 45 to 50% of plants have that. So there's a large wow. uh, endeavor looking at some of these plants all around the world. So it's not just India. India has the largest population and they're looking at a lot of these plants. The second thing you have to realize is that when you have the plant in its natural state, that think of it as a uh, terroir for wine. You can't guarantee the climate, you can't guarantee sun exposure, you can't guarantee water. And you can take plant, take a plant and take one leaf off the plant and take another leaf off the plant. And they can have two extremely different concentrations of that chemical. And it's not just the chemical, it could be contaminants or whatever. You may, you may need the leaf of the plant to get obtain the chemical, but oh yeah, the root or the stem or the berry has a toxin in it that may contaminate it. And so that's what you have to do. The other thing is that a lot of plants have, I'll use the joxin as an example, have a lot of other chemicals that have cardiovascular or cardiotonic effects. So if you look at digoxin or uh, digitalis purpura, the plant that we use to get digoxin, which is a lenoxin trade name, it also has a rapidly acting cardiac glycoside, so called wabane, and it has uh, another chemical called digitoxin, which all three chemicals we've used throughout the years to treat heart disease. So and this is from the foxglove, correct? This is from foxglove, digitalis purpura. It has three active agents that you're able to separate and use them individually or reuse them individually in years past. Now, why is that important? And up until the 1970s, there was a product called Pill Digis. And all it was, was that ground up digitalis leaf. So it was digitalis leaf purpura, digitalis purpura leaf, which contained digoxin, digitoxin, wabane, and another chemical. And so what was difficult about that product, which contained all of the constituents found in the digitalis purpurus leaf, it was very difficult to titrate someone's heart condition. That's the same thing you would do in your backyard. If you think you could grind up some leaves of whatever and use them as a tea or a soup or, or a whatever, that there's no way you can guarantee the purity of it the consistency of what you need or the, um, the dosing of it. There's just no way you could regulate it on a stable basis. Hence, you go, you find the chemical in the flower, you grow the, the plant or whatever, and then you bring it back, you harvest it, you purify it to get only that chemical out. And then uh, the purity is, is um, 
is guaranteed and the potency is guaranteed. So if you need a certain dose, so in, in, in pharmacology, we do dose ranging studies to see what's the dose you need to impact whatever condition you're treating. So now you know that you've got this chemical from this plant, you know it's pure, you know it's potent in a dosage range that will actually treat the illness. That's what you do. You cannot do that with a plant. You can't grind up a plant and get that type of uh, purity and potency to actually control a disease uh, with any kind of regular consistency. Right. So it's all about proper dosage. Right. Um, so these chemicals are found in the plant naturally, but without dialing in and, you know, getting down to um, a purity level where, you know, this exact amount will fix, right. you know my slow growing fingernails or whatever it is, then it's not medicine. It, it can be, that's where the potential harm comes into play. And so I'll tell you, and this is, these are a couple of true stories. We talk about harm. We get the Georgetown University Medical Center uh, newsletter every quarter. And last year they had a story of a young woman who wanted to have a very healthy, holistic life. She was into yoga. She was into watching her diet. She was very in tune to her body and her lifestyle. And so she was taking natural products. What happened is the natural products uh, she was taking harmed her liver to such an extent that she needed a liver transplant. Jeez. That's the downside. And so I was in a, a study, uh, when I was at the NIH in the 1990s, we had a lot of uh, young men coming up from Washington, D.C. who are HIV positive, taking St. John's wort. Uh, it was, obviously, it's used as an antidepressant, but it was also believed at the time to may have some antiretroviral activity against the HIV virus. And so one of the uh, HIV service physicians asked my colleague, I wonder if there's anything bad about St. John's wort. Does it impact any of the medicines that these uh, people who are HIV positive and trying to control your disease, does it impact any of the medicines? So my colleague rounded up 16 normal volunteers. I was one of the 16 normal volunteers and we took the medicine for a week or so and they measured our blood levels over time. And then we took St. John's wort for a week and we took the drug again for another week. And one day my colleague calls me and says, you got to come to the lab. You're not gonna believe this. And so I went down to his lab and he showed me that not only did the St. John's wort rev up all of our livers to the extent that it was metabolizing the, the uh, HIV medication was called indinavir to such low levels that it may not have worked. But the impact out of all 16 of us was greatest on my liver. And there was almost no drug in me after taking St. John's wort for a week. So did it actually cause toxicity in my body? The answer was no, but it impacted this drug we were taking and it could impact the um, men who are HIV positive that the conclusion of the study was that if you took this drug indinavir and St. John's wort, that it could reduce the levels of indinavir to the effect that it wouldn't be treating your HIV disease or the HIV could become resistant. So that's the downside is that you're taking something. Oh, I feel great. I'm no longer depressed. Oh, by the way, it's impacting another drug I'm taking to control my illness. And now it's not working anymore. So that's a negative adverse effect uh, from that from that perspective. Right. And I think that calls back to a point you made earlier was um, when you said with these herbal medicines, how effective are some of these remedies? when it could make you feel better, but also give you other side effects or mask other symptoms based on, you know, how you feel after you take um, the, pres the prescribed remedy. Right. And I think, you know, masking symptoms or not understanding the symptoms, like I said before, what you have, you think you have, uh, but maybe in fact be something else. And, you know, the story I alluded to where I gave a talk a couple of years ago, and a woman came up to me and talked about her daughter who had a friend who had a child that had these seizures, new onset seizures. And she talked to a friend of hers who was into herbal remedies and said, you know, your child just has these infantile seizures. He's going to grow out of them. Here, take this medicine, whatever it was. Lo and behold, the seizures got worse. And lo and behold, he didn't have a seizure disorder. He had a brain tumor. So in the sense that people who think that they, I, the, one of the classic sayings I get is, I know my body, I know it works. Well, in this case, the child was harmed. It was the, a delay in seeking appropriate therapy that she thought and believed based on her friend saying, oh, he's got infantile seizures. 
and in fact, get a brain tumor. And I think that's the risk of using compounds like this, or, you know, I'm not saying these are very valuable sources of very effective medicines. But if you use them appropriately, you may, de you may delay therapy or you may mistreat something uh, in the sense you need to treat something other than what you think you're treating. And I think that's important to recognize as a risk. Yeah. So that kind of leads to my next question of kind of what the role of these plants are, um, not just in modern medicine, but I guess in the future. Part of this, I think, is that people have so much distrust right now. And uh, I mean, you can just look at the vaccine rollout and how many people refuse to take this vaccine that people just don't trust the government, they don't trust corporations, they don't trust the media. Does Is there any, like, what is the role of these plants as um, people, I guess, turn to themselves and try to find some sense of control of what's going on around them? It, it's interesting. First off, these plants will always be viable sources of very effective medicines. There's no question about that, like we talked about earlier. People who want to avoid natural people who want to avoid, let's say, you know, chemical medicines, well, you're taking a chemical when you take these natural products. And one of the, one of the obnoxious slides I have in my talk is it's not about the plant, it's about the chemical in the plant. And people need to understand that. That I, I actually had a discussion a couple of years ago with a woman who really believed that it was the leaf she was taking curing her disease and not the chemical in the leaf. And I think people either want to believe that or don't really understand it doesn't work that way. And so I think people who want to do this there, I think they are first off, like I said before, that you want to avoid modern medicines, you want to avoid modern doctors, you want to avoid, you know, the pharmaceutical industry. But what you're doing, like we talked about before, is maybe putting yourself at risk because you think you're taking something natural when in fact what you're growing in your garden may be contaminated, may not have enough chemical in it to treat what you have. Um, and so I think that with people doing that, all you're doing, I think, is deceiving yourself and maybe preventing yourself from actually getting appropriate care. Now, I'll tell another story that uh, my wife and I were in Edinburgh, Scotland a couple years ago, and we went by this herbalist shop uh, dating back to the 1860s. And well, lo and behold, I'm reconstituting an 1865 medicinal garden in America. So I went in to talk to him, told him I was a pharmacist, and he was a trained herbalist. So the uh, Edinburgh Botanical Garden has a nine-month a thesis-based diploma granting program to become an herbalist. And he was a graduate of that program. And so I was talking to him and he had a beautiful shop. Again, it's 120 years, 160 years old that I said, um, what do you, I, the first thing when I said, I said, well, I'm a pharmacist. And he just kind of smiled and said, we don't have the science that you do. And so we got to talking and I said, how do you know that what's on the label on that bottle is what it is in that dose? And he said, we don't. He said, it's not regulated like regular medicines. We have no idea that in fact it is. We think it is. We have no doubt it, but can I guarantee it? The answer is no. And I said, what if somebody comes in here and says, you know, I don't want to uh, use a real medicine. I have this disease or that disease or whatever. I don't want to take, you know, these commercial medicines made by the pharmaceutical company. I want something natural. And he said, flat out, go see a doctor and get a real medicine. And so I think that that here's somebody who's trained in this field who has a realistic view and says if you're really sick you need a real medicine. And you know if you don't if you don't treat your hypertension appropriately you're going to stroke, you're going to kill your kidneys. If you don't treat your diabetes appropriately, there's going to be consequences uh, with blindness and neuropathies and things like that. So the reality is can you do this Sure, you probably could, but I think the effort it's going to take to do this and actually to control your disease, uh, I don't think most lay people have the knowledge and understanding to do that. It seems like there's a difference between, like, it seems like, no, there definitely is a difference between basic first aid and treating small ailments versus actually curing diseases and tackling larger health problems with these plants. It seems like they can, they run the gamut of uh, doing a lot of things. So... Are there any plants that you would recommend putting in a small garden or for people who like to grow tomatoes and um, their own peppers? Is there anything that you can think of that has common use that is safe to put into home gardens or anything that you would recommend or use personally? 
I, I, I would use nothing personally. Again, so unfortunately, you know, I'm a pharmacist and I come from big science. And I think that there's no guarantee that what you put in there is going to be, I think, adequate to treat something. I mean, sure, we all have aloe plants in our house that when you get a right. burn off the iron skillet, you put aloe on it. I think that's fine. I think that other things, I think it's just too risky. And and I, I and I'll be perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah, I'm a pharmacist, I'm a big science guy. I think these are great ornamental plants, but I think the risk of you trying to self-diagnose yourself with a condition and then go to your garden and take something out of your garden and use that as an active therapy, I think the risk is too great. People do it every day. I'm, I'm not, I understand that. And people will say, oh, I can tell you wrong. I can tell you I do this every day. That's fine. But I think the average person doesn't have the scientific, the medical background to really understand what they have is what they have and that what they're going to pull out of the garden actually works for what they think they have. I think the risk is too great. And I think that there's, they've actually done studies to look at what compound is actually in that flower. And oh, by the way, it only had minuscule amounts. Why is that? The weather, the location, the climate, the soil, whatever, that's the risk. Do you think there's um, value in getting people exposed to these type of uh, medicinal gardens in order for them to, uh, I guess, uh, be more aware of, I I think there's like a little bit of uh, um, an aura that surrounds this world of like natural medicine and these types of things. Um, and I think with science, we have this really unique opportunity to kind of smash that mirror, whatever you want to call it, that kind of makes it seem like it's outside of the scope of logic, I guess you could say. I, I think that's a great idea. I think people need to be exposed to this to understand what the beneficial impacts of the chemicals that we get from these medicinal plants, but also to understand the risks and limitations. When I talk on this subject, uh, I talk, I give my public service announcements about these are the risks that you're going to undertake if you think you can do this. And, you know, one of the questions I get is, why can't I do this at home? I said, well, do you fix your car at home? Oh, no, I take it to a mechanic. Well, what makes you think you could diagnose yourself and then treat it with these plants from your garden? And it gives them pause for a minute because, oh, I never thought of that. And so I think people need to understand Um, like I just said, no one's questioning the value of plant-derived medicines. And we're going to be doing this for the next thousands of years, for the next thousands of years. But you need to understand the risks. You can't do this at home without the knowledge of what you're actually looking for, uh, the part of the plant you need, how you're going going to refine it, how you're going to purify it, how you're going to extract it, how you're going to guarantee the potency. If you can't do that, then what are you doing? I think this... uh calls back to what Andy had said earlier about the mistrust. And I think that's where the divide comes in between um, people seeking natural remedies versus taking um, commercial prescription drugs is you don't know, we we don't know what's in the plant. We don't know the purity of the active ingredient that we're seeking versus we don't know if they're putting like, how do you know if they're using the natural active ingredient versus chemical analog that they've created in a lab that looks like it under a microscope, but might not necessarily be the natural ingredient? That's, so that's a great question. And I'm glad you asked that because if you have, I'll say this, we'll use foxglove and the joxin as an example to answer this question. If you go and take some foxglove um, leaves and actually extract digoxin from that leaf. So you have naturally obtained digoxin. If you then go into a laboratory and pull a bunch of chemicals off the shelf and and go through a number of chemical reactions and come up with digoxin that was chemically synthesized, guess what? It's the exact same compound. It doesn't matter that you got it from the plant or that you synthesized it. In a lab, the structure of digitoxin is digitoxin or digitoxin or belladon or scopolamine or whatever. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the chemical structures are the same. It's the same product. If you ran them on a gas chromatograph, one from the plant and one from the lab, guess what? It would both give you the same printout at the end of the day. So it doesn't matter where you obtained it or how you made it the compound is still the same compound. And because one came from a plant and one came from the lab at the end of the day, it's still the joxin or digitoxin or whatever. 
It's the exact same. And and that's what turns it from a plant into a medicine is that exact process. Exactly. I think what's interesting, I look, so when I write the column for the museum's website that I use tech, I use the United States Pharmacopeia, which the United States Pharmacopeia has been around since 1820. Uh, it had its 200th anniversary last year. And that sets the standards for purity and potency for all drugs approved in the United States. And if you go through the USP, it tells you exactly how to extract, at least in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, how to extract that chemical from that plant to then use it uh, as a medicine. And we still do that today. So the USP sets the standard for all the drugs we use today. So I guess this kind of brings me to this something you brought up that I wasn't even aware of, or it never really occurred to me, is the involvement now uh, with government agencies in alternative medicine. I think there's a lot of fear from people that don't know a lot about this industry, that it was legitimizing a an industry that shouldn't be legitimized, but it sounds like it's actually something a little different where they're trying to uh, get a hold of what these companies are doing and selling over the counter or uh, not over the counter uh, on shelves. Um, and you don't, there's no you know regulation at what's actually in any of these things that are natural, whatever extracts, medicines, you name it. Uh, is that kind of the, the interests of uh, the government getting involved with that type of stuff? Yeah, and I think they should. So if you go back to the FDA, the the FDA came into bearing, I forget the exact years, but the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act talked about the purity of of compounds. You could, you could, you know, if you go back a hundred years to the 1920s, today we use strychnine as a as rat poison. Strychnine was used as a tonic in the 1920s. It had no therapeutic benefit. Um, And so I think that a lot of people sold snake oil as therapeutic. Uh, remedies. And we all know, so we, we never really got into the safety and efficacy of drugs, but probably one of the biggest, saddest events of the 1950s was a drug called thalidomide, where uh, mothers took thalidomide when they were pregnant and they birthed babies that had seal arm deformities. And that's when the FDA really took a role in studying the not only the efficacy, but also the safety of drugs. Also, along with that, they have guidelines for purity and potency, along with with the um, United States Pharmacopeia. When we did our St. John's wort study, we could only find one product that actually guaranteed it was St. John's wort in the dose that was specified on the label. So that tells you a lot right there. When you can go and buy, like the gentleman in Edinburgh, Scotland said, yeah, I can't guarantee what's in that bottle is, is what it is in that dose. When you can't guarantee something, then what are you spending your money on? If you think that that is whatever chemical it is to treat whatever ailment, and there's no guarantee that it is that chemical, it is pure, and it's in that dose, are you willing to take that risk and spend your money on that? What government regulations want to do is regulate to say, yeah, that compound is that compound. It's going to be plus or minus 4% uh, when it's in that bottle and you take it. Right now, we have no guarantees. When you walk into uh, and you buy a store and you buy these alternative medicines, given that it's not regulated, you have no guarantee it is what it is and that label specified dose. And that's the reality. And so if you want to do that, that's fine. I'm not willing to do that. And so that brings me to my my next question. I work in the medical marijuana field in Mm -hmm. Massachusetts. That's exactly what the regulation is trying to boil down to right now is we have to guarantee what exactly, you know, species and dosage and percentage of active ingredient is included in the plant. Do you have any experience or um, do you see this being actually used as medicine going forward now that it seems to be losing its tinge and sort of coming into the realm of medicine as accepted practice? I'll tell you two stories. If you go back to uh, the 19 or the 1840s uh, United States dispensatory um, and you read about cannabis Americanus, it talks about the gibbles and the munchies that a lot of people know from their college days. But I think on a serious note, cannabis Americanus goes back over 160 years. There's no question today about the medical benefit of marijuana, cannabis, and the various constituents within marijuana. I think it's a very viable uh, medicine used. I remember when um, 
one of the constituents came out when I was in pharmacy school in the late 1970s, used for cancer-related nausea and vomiting, uh, cancer-related um, re reduction in appetite, and things like that. So it used to stimulate the appetite, i.e. the munchies, that I think there's great value to uh, the compounds contained within marijuana. And I think what you said about how the state is trying to control it to ensure potency, uh, to look at the lineage of plants that come down here in Maryland, they have a very strict uh, guidance document on people that want to grow medical marijuana and how potency, what the, what the lineage is of the plants and things like that to ensure that the compounds coming to market are actually what they are in the stated doses. So I think that uh, there's no question on the medical value of the product. I think it's been, you know, mis uh, maligned for a long, long time when it shouldn't have been because I think it has great value. And I think in the right hands and the right farmers, if you will, growing it and showing that the product is a quality product, uh, I think that's what we need. I think that's a great analogy of uh, looking at how we should look at other other medicinal plants and their compounds is the way we've looked at medical marijuana because I think it's a great model uh, going forward. I'll do my best. You've had a long career in medicine, and it sounds like you've had a pretty extensive history in gardening and uh, being around plants. I'm curious if that relationship with um, the gardening aspect and the plants themselves has changed your perspective or your uh, how you think about medicine, both from the alternative side, which uh, is obviously super problematic, and also the traditional side. Does it give you a little bit more of a, a nuanced understanding of each of these positions? Well, I think what it, it does, it, it gives me a great, so the way I put it in perspective today is when I look at my 1850s medical and pharmacy textbooks and the way the doctors and the apothecaries, pharmacists understood how these, how these medicines work, how these medicines worked in the 18, mid 1800s, it's the, it's where we are with lay people today because I see the exact same analogies and people talking about a lot of uh, experiential evidence of how these chemicals worked. Hey, I took this, I had this, I took this, it worked. Uh, and to read the descriptions of doctors taking the medicines and not knowing the science, now that I know the science, I understand what they're describing based on the modern day science that wasn't available to them back then. If you read, and again, using foxglove as, as an example, if you read the 1850s uh, medical textbooks and doctors describing dosing themselves with foxglove or digitalis purpura and getting sick two or three days later, getting really sick and really toxic, well, it takes that long for, for dig, digoxin to accumulate in your body. And then it takes some days to recover. Well, it's because it's called a long half-life. It takes a long time to leave your body. They didn't know that in the 1840s. We know that in 2021. So I understand now what they're saying based on modern day science. And I think if I look what I read in the 1840s and I read a lot of the lay stuff on the internet or uh, in these natural remedy books you can buy, what they're describing is really a lack of understanding of how it works. And so by doing what I'm doing, I really have a greater appreciation for how much science is really added and how much science has accumulated over the last 150 years since the time of the Civil War, where my garden is based to where we are today, the amount of science. And I have to give them credit. You know, they did a lot of studying back in the 1860s, and they found a drug like Arnica was quite toxic. Uh, if you took it internally, well, what did they do? They took it out of the official compendia. And so, yeah, you can use it for scrapes and bruises and things like that externally, but you can't take it internally. And now it's, it's no longer a, a recognized official compound. So I think they were very intuitive. And as the science came along, they really changed their views on uh, how drugs should be used, if they should be used at all. So do you have any, um, I don't want to say hope, because I feel like that it has some implications, but um, you, you made a comment about that you feel like the, the layman today is where science was 150 years ago. Do you, ha I, I'll, I guess I'll stick with hope. Do you have any hope that the layman will improve in that knowledge? Yeah, I, I think we're seeing that today. Like I said, you know, the book I have on natural remedies from the 1970s is just horrific. And some of the new books I have today, uh, they're really evaluating some of the science. Uh, this one book I have rates the quality and the quantity of science. The, um, 
the book I have uh, on medicinal plants from the Chelsea Physic Garden in England actually talks about contraindications. So I think that with all the knowledge that we can glean on the internet, I think the internet is a wonderful source to, for people to really investigate a compound that they want to take, whether it's something from you know, medicinalherbs.com all the way to scientific studies, they have access to that today. And I, I think the way people are becoming more knowledgeable and more informed, I think they have the opportunity uh, to go out and to investigate these compounds, whether they're willing to do it and take the time. I think that's another issue, but I think the information is there to help them make their decision. I think to go naively into a garden and, and pick a flower and ingest it Today, I think there's no reason to do that. I think you have so much knowledge out there that if you're willing to take the time to access it, you can make a uh, informed decision. And that brings up a point because I'm a novice to gardening. And I, like I said in a previous episode, I have the only thing I've ever planted was in a red solo cup and I'm pretty sure it sprouted and then quickly died. But when I think of herbal medicine and I, I can only think of pop culture and references to old shaman, and usually it's older people who have accumulated a wealth of knowledge and how to safely use these plants. It's never some you know young and up and coming rising healer or anything that knows everything about these plants. It's always somebody older trying to pass down the knowledge. And I think that's why these plants will probably remain in aesthetic gardens moving forward rather than you know being introduced to the wild. But there is one plant that you did talk about in the blog that I wanted to bring up, and that's the hops. So mm -hmm. could you tell us more about the Maryland-style hops that you had bandied about? So that was there from the previous uh, iteration of the garden. So uh, that's something that we planted. But clearly, beer, mead, wine goes back thousands of years. You know, the water was contaminated, so people drank mead and wine and beer and stuff like that. So I think. I think beer, as an example, hops, let's say, uh, as a sort as a you know primary constituent of beer, probably clearly had more social benefit than I think medicinal benefit. So I think it was part and part of that when you think about you know the way stations along the road and people stopping off and having their pint uh, of beer because the water was bad in the you know thousands of years ago, I think there's more social, benefit to beer than there is medicinal benefit. I can't think of, you know, I'm sure there is. I don't know. I've never really investigated it from a medicinal standpoint. Uh, you can find hops in the medical textbooks of the period. Um, I really haven't investigated it uh, that much farther. But I want to go back to a comment you said a moment ago about the shaman. So a lot of what we know about natural medicines goes back thousands of years where maybe early man looked at what the animals ate and what they didn't eat. And so, oh, that's pretty good. You know, just look around your household gardens and what the deer and the groundhogs eat. Why do they eat one thing and not another? Is because they don't like the taste? Is there something prickly they don't want to get pricked in the nose when they go and stick their nose in the garden? Or is it toxic? So a lot of people learned first from the animals. And then they probably saw, they took some of these plants and they realized, oh yeah, it had a positive effect on something. And that was collected. And then that was passed down over the generations, you know, mother to daughter. And then you had maybe the village healer, the shaman, the medicine man or whatever. If you look at Native Americans and the medicine man um, and looking at some of the, you know, peyote and stuff like that. There, I think that's a huge source of, untapped information to go to these uh, healers, whether they're, you know, medicine men in Native America or, or other medicine men around the world to talk to them to find out what is it, why are you using it and what do you see? And to then to take those compounds and investigate them to see what the active compounds are and do they actually work for that disease that the medicine man is using it for, or does it have other medicinal values that could be, where it could be used? So I think that's a huge untapped source of information. We're going around the world and picking plants and investigating them for their medicinal activity, yet there's a whole body of men or women 
who know this. When I was at the NIH, one of our critical care medicine fellows was a Native American, and her grandfather was a Native American medicine man, and he was traveling around the country to medical schools. He actually came to Maryland and gave a lecture at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine back in the early 90s. That's an untapped source of knowledge to at least understand what they're using, why they're using it, and what the effects are, that I think that's another active area for study. Absolutely. So it sounds like the knowledge is already there, and it sounds like the science at this point would be coming to reaffirm and to confirm, you know, what is already known or what's already been in practice for, you know, longer than the books have been in play. Yeah, and we have the opportunity to um, further isolate the chemicals that we may not know about and um, use them more uh, accurately, I guess, uh, in ways that... Appropriately, I think that, you know, because I think uh, once you realize what it's used for, it's like, oh, wait, it's not going to work for that. You're going to get better in seven to 10 days, so to speak. But you know what? It's got this structure. It falls into this class. I think we can use it to treat something else. More tools for the toolbox, because I'm sure right. every doctor could use that. That's right. So you mentioned that there's still a lot of research going on in these plants. I, again, I don't come from a medical background. I'm a farmer and a tax guy. So this is like just a hobby of mine. I, I was always under the impression that I guess medicine had not exhausted, but had for the most part gone through the plants that are out there. It seems now, I guess, that it, that's not really the case in terms of like what the research has been that's been done. Like how, how much of the plants that are out there that we've that that we know about do we actually have any data on? Right. Are there any new discoveries or any plants that are being rediscovered, I guess, right? Well, I think that's, like I said it, um, before, India is the hotbed for looking at uh, plant-derived medicines. And if you actually go to the scientific literature, there's a lot of studies coming out of India looking at chemicals being derived from that. Now, some of these chemicals may be similar to chemicals that already exist. So you may have compound A that already exists, but oh, by the way, we found compound B in this plant and it has similar activity. Well, is that something we can use in people who no longer respond to chemical A? Does it have a, do people have a greater response? Is it more potent, so to speak, uh, than chemical A? So, or is it something new, a completely different class that acts uh, the same way or acts differently that either helps chemical A work or works you know, or has the same endpoint or efficacy as chemical A. So that that's a very active study right now. So are we going to go back and looking at Foxglove and Digitalis Purpura for, you know, new digoxin products? No, but we're going to go to other parts of the world and look at these plants to see what are the chemical structures. And there's only five basic chemical structures. And if you look at that, once you see what the chemical structure is, you can then go out and kind of assimilate that to, well, where does that fit in these classes of medicines uh, to be used? So is it a steroid? Is, is it one of the other co compounds or structures that can be then modular modified to do have an antibiotic effect, have a, a chemotherapy effect, have a cardiac effect, have a pulmonary effect? Uh, what, can, what can they do with that? So that's what they're doing right now. So we've exhausted what we know, but we don't know what we don't know that's still out there. And I think that's the exciting part. Yeah, that's it is exciting. Uh, I guess, really hopeful in terms of the things we haven't solved yet medicinally. So I guess you've kind of alluded to it at this point for people that are interested and want to know more and are going in with their eyes open. It sounds like there are a couple of books you would recommend, even if it was, wasn't necessarily because you're going to use it, but you think are fair and accurate representations. I think one of the more respected sources, uh, and it's fairly straightforward, is Peterson's Field Guide to Medicinal Plants and Herbs in North America. I have that on my coffee table. Yeah, there you go. So you know what it looks like. And I think it's a nice overview. But again, you know, it's not really giving you a lot of the science. And I think you're familiar with that. But I think it's a good starting point. This is a place... Um, when I'm working on the garden, if my wife and I are going to some place, this is the book I throw in the car. I think it's a good, it's a well-respected book. I think it's well done. There's others are out there that aren't as complete as this. And the one that I got yesterday, you can get this on Amazon, is from the Chelsea Physic Garden Herbal. It's Healing with Plants, 2021. It's actually beautifully done. 
Uh, it's really nice. My wife's a graphic designer and she really liked the look of the book. Uh, it's got some basic drugs in here and it's, I think it's realistic. It talks about contraindications and cautions. So the first section is uh, caution, which I think is helpful. So I think these would be two books I would start with Peterson because it's just been around a long time. It's well respected. And the Chelsea Physic Garden has been around since 1673. I've actually toured it a number of years ago. I think the quality of their work, I'm actually a member of the garden. I think they do um, nice work. So I would start with this. Um, I don't, when I've looked on the internet, I'm very, the sites I've gone to, there's such a hodgepodge of information out there. I think the internet is missing. Anybody can put anything on the internet. And I think, um, that's good and that's bad. And I think it may be hard to decipher what's out there. I actually looked at one site, which I don't remember what it is now, but when it talked about medical uses, it had every conceivable illness under the sun. And that, that's an, uh, an exaggeration, but nothing works against everything. And you have to understand the limitations of these medicines. And to say that it's going gonna, it's gonna to work for this, that, and the other thing, it doesn't make sense. And as a pharmacist, I know the science to be able to understand that. I think as a lay person, they may not be able to do that, take it at face value, and then get something that they didn't expect from taking that plant. And that's been abused in time memoriam, going back to the Old West when you mentioned snake oil earlier. Exactly. And people taking advantage of of that, making a quick buck. Yeah. I, I guess that's the warning. That's the caveat. You can either trust somebody to sell you a medicine that they says work, or you can go out and eat, eat your herb garden. Yeah. I mean, I find it frightening personally. If you go on YouTube, the amount of people that are my age or younger that are um, so-called experts in things like medicinal plants. And um, I just, I don't see how that's possible. And uh, that, that can be a dangerous game. You know, I, I graduated pharmacy school 40 years ago. I have Eight years of training and 40 years of experience and i still don't know and i think to for people to become you know the coroner herbalist i think is fraught with risk and i think that you know a man's got to know his limitations and just because you read a couple of articles in a book or a couple of articles on the internet to start prescribing natural based remedies um, for diseases that you may not be familiar with especially telling people what they should do um, I think that's risky. And I think that to me, as a healthcare professional, to see diagnosis delayed and harm coming to somebody because they didn't seek out a medical appropriate medical care at a reasonable amount of time, they tried to use alternative medicines. Uh, and then they have something that can't be cured, or the disease has progressed to the point where now they have, you know, it's impacted their body. I, I think that's sad. And I think it's tragic. I think that's that's a better word. And when you kind of prevented something by going to see a doctor and getting a, a, a commercial, well-studied uh, medicine, um, when you wanted to use something that was more, quote, healthy, and you actually caused more harm, I think it is tragic. In the right hands, you have to understand what you're doing. In the wrong hands, it's going to be fraught with danger. I'll wrap this up with kids. Don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what I do. Every time I get that question and I lecture, I, I, that's what I tell people. Don't try this at home. Yep. Um, so let me ask two, I guess, two remaining questions. The first is, if people are interested in what you're doing, where would you want to send them to? If they want to learn more about the Pride Garden or... Well, so if, if they want to go, if they want to learn about the Pride Garden, they can go to civilwarmed.org, which is the main website for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And under the search... <coughs> area, excuse me, type in Pride Garden or Medicinal Garden, and they'll come to the garden's website. And are you guys going to be doing more updates on that website? Uh, absolutely. So I, I, we uploaded one last month on um, the mints, peppermint and spearmint. Oh, I did see that. I read that today. Yeah. And today I'm working on one on Senna, which is a Senna cot a laxative. Uh, I'll, I'll submit that one this week. And then after that will be um, valerian, which is used as a sedative and then a gentian after that, and then chamomile. So um, those are probably gonna be up over the next uh, five or six months. So we're trying to do one a month, but the mints went up today and hopefully the, um, uh, the center one will be up by the end of the month. And that's an interesting drug too. And I can tell you another story about that, but well, actually I will tell you that story because I think it's important. 
I have a friend who's a nuclear engineer and he had some issues with some surgery and um, he went to see a surgeon and he talked to a friend of his and said, um, oh, you don't need a surgeon. You just go take this peppermint tea. And so he called me a while after that and said, Greg, I've been taking this peppermint tea and I can't stop going to the bathroom. I can't leave the house. I said, send me the link. Diuretic. No, it was a cathartic laxative. And so when he sent me the label of this peppermint tea, peppermint tea all over the box on the back side, oh yeah, it has uh, 1,080 milligrams of senna leaves. Okay. Well, we grow senna in the garden and 1,080 milligrams of, of um, senna leaves is actually a fairly large dose. If you actually go and pick up a bottle of Senecot, Senecot tablets, the active ingredient in Senecot is senicides, and the actual dose is 84 micrograms. 84 <laughs> micrograms. And in this product, it was 1,080 milligrams of senna leaves. I can't even do that math. Yeah. There's commas involved. Exactly. You're exactly right. And that gives you an, an, an example of, you know, taking this product that's, quote, natural, not understanding that it's not, he kept talking to it, it's peppermint tea, peppermint tea. It's not peppermint tea. It's a laxative. It's got senna in it. And 1,080 milligrams delivers, I don't know how many micrograms of senicides, but in him, he had an overreaction to it. And so I think that's the issue about don't do this at home. Good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Bad night. Great. Uh, any other parting thoughts? Anything we didn't cover you wanted to cover? No, I, I think that I think the only point I really want to convey to people is this is not something that you think you can do at home by yourself. You have a have a tremendous respect for this. Just because it's natural, it doesn't mean it's safe. And my very first lecture in pharmacy school was by the professor that talked how to make tablets and capsules and the like. And he said, I sat in your chair 20 years ago here at UConn School of Pharmacy. He goes, I'm going to tell you this today because I don't want you to forget this. For the next three years, you're going to hear about all the wonderful things that drugs do. They're going to cure cancer, treat hypertension, treat cholesterol, but they also do bad things. They turn off pathways the body doesn't want turned off. They turn on pathways the body doesn't want turned on, and they can cause bad effects on people. And I think that's important to realize, although it's a natural product, it still can have bad effects if not used uh, in an appropriate way. And so I think that, I, to me, I just want my last two words are, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe and effective. And I think that's important. And respect to these plants, I think, is paramount. I'll add to that or just tack on at the end that th this isn't a hobby and to give you credit where credit is due, you've made this your career and your life's work. And, and that's the kind of time that goes into it in order to give, give it the proper respect right. from turning it or seeing it as a plant and using it as the medicine um, that is prescribed by professionals. I agree. I think that's, that's a good point. Thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Right. Have a good evening, guys. As always, if you enjoy the episode, please give us a review on iTunes, which heavily impacts our outreach to new listeners and helps us bring on new and exciting guests. We appreciate your support, and we hope you enjoyed this conversation and this episode at the Poor Pearls Almanac. My name is Elliot. This is Andy. Later, nerds. Later, nerds.